Club Penguin was a massively multiplayer online game that was launched in 2005 and enjoyed by millions of players until it was eventually discontinued in 2017. Although the game was probably one of the safest spaces on the internet for children, there was still a dark side that not everyone knew about. Let's investigate. If you enjoy internet mysteries and generally disturbing content, feel free to subscribe and turn on notifications for more content like this. If you're interested in supporting the channel, you can become a Ko-fi member or a channel member to gain access to uncut videos and other perks, or you can leave me a tip by clicking the thanks under this video. Thanks to anyone who considers this. This video will cover a range of topics that some might find triggering, including grooming and inappropriate content featuring children. Viewer discretion is advised. If you're a subscriber of this channel and you're watching this video, chances are you like mysteries and games, so allow me to introduce you to June's Journey, the sponsor of today's video. June's Journey is an exciting mystery game with a gripping detective story where you'll find hidden objects to solve the murder of June's sister while uncovering family secrets along the way. It's set in the 1920s and its beautifully crafted scenes give it a unique charm. You'll meet a variety of intriguing characters that immerse you in the game and you can customise, remodel and fix your mansion and garden island to make it feel like home. I'm fascinated by murder mysteries, so I was instantly drawn in by the storyline of June's journey, and I also love how relaxing it is finding clues. It's a perfect way to wind down at the end of the day. You can download June's journey for free by clicking the link below in the description or scanning the QR code on screen now. It's available on Android and iOS, or you can play on PC through Facebook games. Although I dabbled in a few online games as a child, none had me in a chokehold quite like Club Penguin. When I was around 8 years old, I was absolutely hooked on it. I'd spend the whole day at school itching to go home and get back on it, and play until the early hours of the morning. I'd spend weekends and school holidays glued to the screen, and any pocket money I got would be saved up to buy a membership. I ran a blog dedicated to Club Penguin news, tips and cheats, and made music videos in the game with the iconic unregistered Hypercam 2, which I'd then upload on YouTube, and honestly, my editing skills haven't improved much since. A few months ago, I was feeling particularly nostalgic and decided to play a couple of old games from the past. I bought a second-hand Nintendo DS solely to play The Sims 2 and Cooking Mama, can't say the latter was particularly exciting at the age of 25, but Sims 2 didn't disappoint. Anyway, unfortunately Club Penguin was officially discontinued in 2017, but since then, various private servers have been created, so you can still play a remake of the game, and of course I did. I spent a whole day reveling in nostalgia, remembering simpler times where all you had to worry about was how you were going to decorate your igloo at Christmas, and when CP only stood for Club Penguin. Me going around the internet now advertising my awesome CP site wouldn't seem as innocent as it did back then. I think it would have been late 2006 when I first started playing the game, and sometime in 2009 when I finally gave up. A lot had changed by the time it ceased to exist in 2017, so the version I played on a private server more recently was a little different to what I remembered in some ways. There weren't many other penguins around, and without the novelty of things like themed events, it wasn't anywhere near as lively as it used to be. But it still scratched the itch. I enjoyed re-exploring all the familiar places, playing games and earning coins to buy some hideous outfits or daft items for my igloo. Despite the excitement of reminiscing about old times though, I did start reflecting on some of the darker aspects of the game, 
a lot of which I either didn't even notice at the time or was too naive to see the problem with, and that's what inspired me to make this video. While some of the drama relating to the private servers is pretty well known and has been covered by other creators, I haven't seen anyone talk about some of the problems with the original game, and there isn't much information on a lot of this online, so I'd be intrigued to hear in the comments if anyone watching also remembers any of this. It'd be good to know that I wasn't the only one obsessed with the game to a questionable extent. I won't waste too much time explaining the history and development of Club Penguin, there are already a couple of videos on YouTube that cover this in depth. To summarise though, a developer named Lance Praib created a Flash 4 game called Snowblasters in July 2000 that was basically the predecessor of Club Penguin. It was never actually finished and instead morphed into Experimental Penguins, which was released by the company Lance worked for at the time, Rocket Snail Games. It wasn't much of a success though and went offline the following year. It was replaced by Penguin Chat, then Penguin Football Chat, or Penguin Chat 2, in January 2003, which contained various mini-games, including one that was pretty similar to the Hydro Hopper game that you'll be familiar with if you ever played Club Penguin. With the goal of creating a game that had some social components, but was safe, not just marketed as safe, for children, Lance and his co-workers, Lane Merrifield and Dave Crisco, began formulating Club Penguin, based on Penguin Chat 2, which was still online at the time. Although they originally planned to release Club Penguin in 2010, they decided to speed up development, financing it entirely themselves, and it officially went live in October 2005. Within a year, the game had over 2.6 million users, and despite a lack of marketing, its popularity grew at a surprising rate, until Disney eventually acquired it for $350 million. The developers were promised an extra $350 million if the game hit growth targets by 2009, but this didn't end up happening. I started playing Club Penguin just a few months before Disney took over, and I didn't realise at first, but I think that's where it started to go downhill, or at least I think it would have been a lot better if Disney were never involved. Obviously, the original developers were hoping to make a profit from this game, but they also had personal reasons for creating it, whereas Disney had no sentimental attachment to it, it was all about the profit. Club Penguin did have the option for paid membership before it was acquired by Disney, but I noticed after a while that there wasn't much point playing the game if you weren't a member. You were very limited in terms of what you could do without paying to unlock all the features. You could only adopt two puffles, you had limited options for clothing, stamps and decorations for your igloo, and later there were even rooms and features in parties and events that weren't available to users who weren't members. Although there are next to no games around in 2024 that don't contain in-game purchases of some kind, this was much less common in the early days of Club Penguin. There were way more games that you would just pay for when you bought them in the first place, and that was it. The option of paid memberships attracted some criticism from those who felt it encouraged consumerism, and also created a divide between players who were members and players who weren't, which arguably wasn't totally consistent with the original developers' goals of creating a fun and safe environment for children to socialise and enjoy themselves. Memberships were pushed pretty hard too. You'd constantly see adverts for it, reminding you of everything you couldn't do without paying, and members even ended up unwittingly acting as recruiters. After Disney bought the company, they also began selling merch online and in Disney stores, and these items would usually come with a code that you could use to redeem items in the game. Considering the game was specifically designed for children as young as six, some people did find all this a little questionable at the time. Obviously, not every six-year-old's parents could or would pay a recurring fee for membership, and so people would try and find ways around it. Some users who also had their own blogs centred around Club Penguin would hold competitions where the winner would be given a code for membership. 
This was probably the best way that someone could acquire membership without actually paying for it, and the winner would typically be the person who commented most on the post, or you'd be entered if you shared the blog elsewhere online and the winner would be picked randomly. It wasn't uncommon to see people advertising free memberships with referral codes to dubious sites, for example paid survey sites where you'd have to enter all your details, including your name, address and even bank details. This information could then be sold to third parties, which certainly wasn't worth the risk, considering how much time you'd have to spend responding to surveys before you earned a Club Penguin membership. More concerningly, many of the younger children who signed up to these sites wouldn't have had their own bank accounts, meaning they'd likely use their parents' cards, perhaps without their knowledge or permission. Most six-year-olds probably wouldn't put two and two together and realise it might be a scam to clear their parents' bank accounts. I don't recall signing up to any dodgy sites in this way, but I do vividly remember clicking a link on one of these Club Penguin cheat blogs, probably one claiming to give you free coins or something, that somehow led me to a video with the song You Spin Me Round playing as a man, well, spun his bits around. I was horrified and tried to click off the site, but it was just stuck. I tried turning my laptop off and the song just kept playing. Eventually the screen went blank, not that it mattered, because this image was now burned into my brain so much that I can still see it now. It's honestly a miracle that the laptop didn't get a virus from that, or maybe it did but I didn't realise. Either way, it was a pretty shocking moment for me at like 8 years old, and it's a pretty sick prank considering the majority of the people that would have ended up clicking that link would have been children around my age at the time. The naivety of the younger users was often taken advantage of by these bloggers in various ways, not even always for financial gain. Some would tell users they could get them a free membership if the users gave them their login details and they'd end up just deliberately getting the account banned. Not the end of the world in the grand scheme of things, but I know I'd have been devastated if my account was banned after I'd spent a couple of years acquiring rare items that were no longer available. It was kind of a big deal at the time. People would even sell penguins that had rare items or a crazy amount of coins. I heard of people getting scammed this way too. They'd pay the money and never actually get access to the accounts. Perhaps the most questionable way that people would advertise free memberships or accounts would be by providing their email address and telling people to email them for instructions. Now, I don't know for sure that all of these people had nefarious intentions, but I do remember one of my friends at school, who also played the game, telling me she emailed one of these people and they asked her to send inappropriate photos of herself in exchange for a membership code. Thankfully, she didn't do it, but I remember when she told me, we both just found it funny, not realising it was likely some p-file who was trying to prey on children. I look back on my time on Club Penguin and in hindsight wonder how many of the users I interacted with were actually adults pretending to be kids of my age. To give the developers credit, it really does seem like they did everything they could to create a safe virtual environment for kids. They had the strictest filters on chats that I've ever experienced. There was the standard safe chat that allowed users to generate their own messages but it had blocked phone numbers, email addresses and profanity, even catching creative methods of sending profanity, such as using numbers in place of certain letters in swear words. There was also an ultimate safe chat mode, where users could only communicate by selecting a phrase from a list. Users wouldn't usually be notified if their message was blocked, unless it was enough to ban them, but other users wouldn't be able to see it, so they'd just assume they were being ignored and would be less likely to try and circumvent the filter. There were a significant number of paid moderators who would patrol the game and ban anyone who broke the rules, and users could reach elite Penguin Force agent status by reporting others who behaved inappropriately, though there was actually a lot of speculation that the vast majority of these reports were never even reviewed, which makes a lot of sense, considering kids would report each other all the time for no valid reason, 
Investigating all of these reports would have been impossible. The filters weren't 100% effective, though. Users were able to type numbers before July 2007, and there were still over 300,000 words that players were allowed to say, so there were ways of saying inappropriate things if you were creative enough. It wasn't unheard of for swear words to get through the filters if used in a sentence, and of course you didn't have to swear to be inappropriate. I remember one penguin who I'd become friends with got a bit weird, would persistently ask me to be his girlfriend, and would follow me around constantly displaying the heart emoji. They send me postcards all the time and just hang around in my igloo. Of course, I could have just removed them and reported them, but I assumed it was someone my age and didn't want to be mean. In hindsight, though, it could have been a middle-aged man for all I knew. Club Penguin was basically a role-playing game, but some users took this to the extreme and created some pretty bizarre characters, some of whom I don't doubt were actually adults in hindsight. For example, Pookies were penguins who would dress and talk like babies and toddlers. They'd usually be yellow and would carry teddy bears. They'd hang around in the pet shop, waiting for someone to adopt them, begging other players who were dressed more maturely, like, please adopt me, duh duh. Some of these were probably just immature children or trolls, but many believe there were plenty of older users luring in unsuspecting children. If you were an adult predator, you'd have hit the jackpot by role-playing as the parents and having players who actually were children but acted even younger, following you around and calling you Dada or Moo Moo. Other, more normal users would oppose the Pookies, and there were even protests against them, in which groups of players would surround the Pookies and repeatedly say in capitals, No more Pookies. In more extreme cases, they would apparently try to intimidate or harass Pookies, sometimes hiding in a Pookie's igloo or luring Pookies back to their igloos by pretending to be a Moo Moo or Dada. Such behaviour wasn't just reserved for Pookies, and sometimes Penguins would be targeted by one or more fellow players for no reason and cyberbullied to the limited extent that the game allowed. For example, groups of penguins would single out a specific player, especially if they weren't a member, and would all display angry emojis, bombard them with snowballs, and say things as mean as possible without the message being filtered. It all sounds kind of ridiculous, but you have to bear in mind that the game was designed for kids as young as six, and some of the players were even younger. You can see how it might have been quite distressing for them. There were some pretty ruthless trolls too, and some of them would form gangs or armies for the sole purpose of bullying other players. The developers and moderators might have done everything they could to prevent inappropriate behaviour in the game, but they couldn't control what happened outside of it, and these attacks were often orchestrated elsewhere, such as on 4chan. 4chan users would arrange Club Penguin raids in which they'd decide a time and a place and just show up and cause chaos. Perhaps the most infamous army to have mobilised its troops via 4chan was the Purple Republic, who were purple penguins in minor helmets. They would swarm a specific server, act in a hostile manner, and would even arrange themselves in the shape of a swastika. They'd create posters to spread outside the game, declaring purple penguins as the master race, and any other colours as coloured peasants. I don't remember ever encountering the Purple Republic, but I do remember rivalry between red and blue penguins, typically manifesting in snowball fights, being a pretty big deal. There was quite a bit of hostility between these two groups, each believing they were superior and attacking each other. You have to wonder what effect this would have on children in the real world when they're exposed to discrimination based on colour and the idea of a master race. It's not beyond the realm of possibility that kids would begin acting like this in real life. There were actually various armies and gangs that existed throughout Club Penguin's history, such as the Army of Club Penguin, or ACP, which was dedicated to protecting Club Penguin from those who wished to harm it. 
The SCP formed in September 2006 and their colour was green. Their motto was, Defend Freedom, Preserve Justice. According to their website, which can still be viewed now, their major accomplishments were, quote, Winning Club Penguin World War II and World War III, allying many of the strongest armies and becoming a very strong army, one of the only superpowers ever to enter Club Penguin. There were various different servers on the game. Each army would claim specific servers as their territory, and there would be wars when other armies tried to invade and take over. These wars could last months, and sometimes treaties would be written up and signed by both parties at the end. You really had to be there to understand how seriously people took all this. It didn't feel like just a game. Some of the armies were closer to cults than anything else. The leaders were treated like gods by their followers. They'd follow them around and do anything the leaders told them to do, including verbally worshipping them and trying to clear the room of anyone who wasn't a devout follower. Some of these leaders had learned how to cheat the game and get a crazy amount of coins or rare clothing, which gave them an air of mystery and power, perfect for a cult leader. Cheating was a pretty controversial topic on Club Penguin. A lot of players did it, so eventually it was pretty normalised, and this attracted criticism from people who believed it would encourage children to be dishonest in real life. In an attempt to deter players, moderators would ban them for 72 hours, or even forever, if they were found to be cheating. On one hand, this was a good thing. Those who learned how to cheat did have an advantage over those who didn't, and banning them would teach them that dishonest actions have consequences. But the consequences also affected the parents who ended up wasting money. Imagine if you paid for a year membership for your child, and then they got banned forever on day one for doing something that wasn't really that bad. It's not like they were bullying people or inciting violence. They were just trying to get more coins or get an interesting outfit. Perhaps it'd be fair to ban them temporarily, but forever seems a bit extreme. I'm not exactly a tech expert, but I'd assume there would be ways that they could have prevented cheating without just banning people. Anyway, if an army was suspected of cheating, their opponents would jump at the chance to try and get them banned. One example of this is during the feud between the army of Club Penguin and the Underground Mafia's army, whose leader was a penguin named Pink Mafia's. The SCP leader, Ogalthorpe, found the UMA website, which detailed how the UMA were attacking the Mammoth server and hacking the game to get more coins and items. Ogalthorpe left a comment threatening war if the UMA continued their hacking and attacking, and the UMA simply responded with, Bring it on. After a victory in the Battle of Mammoth, where the UMA outnumbered the ACP 6 to 1, the ACP agreed to a ceasefire and used the subsequent time of peace to increase their numbers, leading to more success in the future battles. During this time, the ACP also emailed Club Penguin staff informing them of the UMA's cheating, and eventually Pink Mafia's was banned forever. This was the beginning of the UMA's downfall. It's back to rebellion which weakened the army and inevitably contributed to their defeat in the Battle of Breeze. Although Pink Mafia's had returned with his second account, he soon decided to abandon his army and quit Club Penguin forever. The SCP and its allies ambushed the UMA in what became known as the Battle of Wool Socks, and eventually, the UMA was left with no option but to surrender and agree to an alliance with the ACP. In hindsight, it's hard to believe all this seriously happened, but as I said, players took the game very seriously. This is only a tiny part of the law regarding the armies of Club Penguin. There were countless battles between various groups and even numerous world wars involving many different armies. Of all the cheaters and hackers on Club Penguin, none were more feared than Sanity One. 
It's hard to separate fact from fiction with the story of this enigmatic penguin, but it was apparently the developer of the first CP Trainer, an app that could be used to modify the game, allowing you to change your penguin's name to anything, including the names of moderators and mascots like Rockhopper. You could also use it to change the age of your penguin, get more coins while playing games, and even access member-only features. Most of the hacks, such as the name changes, were only visible to you, but the coin hacks allowed you to buy as many items as you wanted, and those items would be visible to other players. Most of the players with those crazy cluttered igloos had likely used apps like CP Trainers to get all those items, admittedly myself included. Anyway, Sanity1 was basically the god of hacking. Legend had it that he had attacked thousands of accounts, including those belonging to moderators. He apparently became a moderator himself, unofficially of course, and even hacked the Club Penguin blog, allegedly filling it with irrelevant ads in 2007, shortly before Disney bought the game. He ran his own blog where he would share cheats, and in April 2008, announced that he would be leaving the game, but would continue to hack other online games, such as Fliff and Warrock. He never posted since, but his blog is still up, with over 4 million hits. His Sanity1 account had apparently already been banned at this point, but he did have a few backups, and there were various unconfirmed sightings of his other accounts after his final blog post. According to some sources, Sanity1 was well into his 30s. Obviously, there's no way to know for sure, but I doubt he was a young child considering his hacking abilities. I don't know how many of the rumours about what he managed to do were actually true, but people believed them regardless, and no one wanted to get on the wrong side of him for fear of being hacked themselves. There were also a number of well-known penguins in the game that were basically treated like celebrities. The most well-known penguins were, of course, staff members, who played as their own personal penguins, such as Lane Merrifield, whose penguin was called Billy Bob, and others who played as relevant characters in the game, such as Rockhopper and Antarctic. But then there were various average users that somehow made a name for themselves and basically became Club Penguin influencers. Many of these began playing in the early days and had rare pins and items of clothing that made them stand out and seem prestigious. One example was a penguin named Bluzzy, who typically hung out in the North Pole server. She'd usually be surrounded by a large group of fans and there'd be blog posts on where to hang out to maximise your chances of meeting her. People would create these crazy YouTube videos expressing their admiration for her, calling her their best friend, even though they'd never even seen her in the game, let alone spoken to her in real life. Although this was a pretty niche section of pop culture that only affected a tiny portion of the general population, I'd say it was one of the earlier examples of parasocial relationships in our generation. This was before Instagram existed, it was in the early days of YouTube and Twitter, at this time, there was only really the average people and actual celebrities, and the average people wouldn't get to interact with celebrities except in rare circumstances, for example if they went to a concert and got to briefly meet them after. Influencers, which are now somewhere in between average people and the really famous celebrities, like singers and actors, weren't really a thing back then. Nowadays, influencers are pretty well-connected with their followers. It's not some crazy once-in-a-lifetime experience if an influencer responds to you on social media, like it would have been if a celebrity responded to you in the 2000s. This has created some false sense of rapport between influencers and their followers, who now get to see so much of their lives and know pretty much everything about them, giving followers the impression that they actually know these people to some extent. This was kind of the effect that penguins like Bluzzy had on people, obviously to a much lesser degree. She was well known on Club Penguin in certain circles, she wasn't exactly an internet celebrity per se. 
But people idolised her in a similar way to how they idolise influencers now. She managed to create this sense of rapport by sharing details of her life on her YouTube channel, and one video in particular was the talk of the town at the time, titled, The Life of Being Bluzzy. I don't remember everything she said on it, but I do recall her talking about being bullied and also explaining that she was having brain surgery. While she had many fans who were obsessed with her to a creepy extent, there were also plenty of people who disliked her, really disliked her. Part of the hate would have inevitably come from the fact that she was a popular penguin, so of course some were bound to be jealous, not to mention those who had once adored her, experienced the privilege of her accepting their friend request. Then she eventually removed them and they'd take it personally and turn against her. There was also a lot of drama that went down with other penguins, in 2008, a feud began between Bluzzy and another popular penguin, Wordbird. Various others got involved too. I honestly can't remember the details now, and unfortunately I wasn't able to find much information online, so let me know in the comments if you were around during this time and can provide any information. Some of the regular players who once followed Bluzzy and Wordbird ended up taking sides and spread hate against each other, and it got pretty intense at times. While some made YouTube videos and blog posts supporting Bluzzy, others would make content berating her. It even got as far as to use the very limited information available about her to try and work out who she was in real life. They'd post photos that were allegedly of her and criticise her appearance. Most of the bluzzy haters accused her of causing drama for no reason and fabricating details to get attention, such as her breakup with her in-game boyfriend, CPD officer, and even the brain surgery she claimed to be getting in real life. As a result, she ended up leaving Club Penguin and YouTube a couple of times, but eventually came back, which only gave her haters more ammo to say she was an attention seeker. There were also plenty of examples of people impersonating Bluzzy, setting up blogs and YouTube accounts claiming to be her, particularly after she left the game. I don't know to what extent these imposters contributed to people hating the real Bluzzy, especially if they didn't realise it wasn't actually her. As with other aspects of the game we've already discussed, I also wonder if some of these people were actually adults, taking advantage of Bluzzy's fame to communicate with unsuspecting children. It's a worrying possibility, because some of her followers were so infatuated with her that if she said jump, they'd ask how high. I think Bluzzy's biggest mistake was trying to maintain her persona outside of the game. Her YouTube channel ended up quite popular, and in 2009, she was the 10th most subscribed to guru in France. I don't even know how she became somewhat famous in the first place, but there was only so much that could have happened within the game. Maybe she wouldn't have become so well known if she never started a YouTube channel, but she also likely wouldn't have become so hated either. Everything escalated when she began talking about her personal life elsewhere, and this inevitably added to the parasocial relationships that people developed with her, which went one of two ways. While the drama and scandals, from the Bluzzy saga to the 4chan raids, always made their way into the game, they were usually orchestrated or developed elsewhere, and there was nothing the developers could have done to prevent this. As I said before, they already did pretty much everything they could to make Club Penguin safe for children, but they couldn't control what happened outside the game. It's interesting to think that Club Penguin was basically a sandbox game, there were no real goals, you just played games to earn coins to upgrade your character and your igloo. Besides that, you just made your own entertainment, and this was the result. What was designed to be a light-hearted way of socialising and making new friends, for some, turned into a way to gain power and wage war against others, bully and harass people, and it's inevitable that there were a number of adults posing as children, using the game to take advantage of kids and roleplay for their sick gratification. 
I'm surprised no one took the opportunity to do a serious psychological study on all this. The results would have been pretty fascinating. The game kind of ended up serving as an unintentional social experiment, a testament to the fact that no matter how safe and moderated a place on the internet is, it's bound to succumb to degeneracy, at least to some extent. The state of affairs on Club Penguin were nowhere near as dark as on the private servers, though. In January 2017, it was announced that Club Penguin would officially be discontinued on the 29th of March, and there would be a special event, the Waddle On Party, in the last two months to celebrate the history of the game and to bid it farewell. After hearing the announcement, players who had abandoned it many years ago rushed back to the site for their final dose of nostalgia. Many moderators and mascots frequently visited for the party, and a number of free items were given to players who met mascots like Rockhopper, Sensei and Rookie. The final days of the game were chaos. Knowing this was the end and the consequences didn't matter anymore, many players went mad and competed with each other on who could get banned the fastest. By far the most exciting occurrence was related to the iceberg. It had long been rumoured that if enough penguins drilled on one side of the iceberg it would tip, and so players tried this for years to no avail. They decided to give it one last shot at the end, and finally, the iceberg tipped. Honestly, one of the biggest regrets in my life is that I missed that iconic moment. There was a note on the tipped iceberg that read, Together, we can build an island, create a community, change the world, and even tip an iceberg. Waddle on. I'm almost getting teary-eyed just thinking about it. It was announced that on the final day of the game, all users would be given a free membership until the servers were disconnected. It truly went out with a bang. On the 30th of March, at 12.01am, Penguin Standard Time, players were met with a message. The connection has been lost. Thank you for playing Club Penguin. Waddle on. And that was it. The end of an era. But Disney weren't about to let the whole franchise die completely, and they soon released Club Penguin Island, a mobile game that had similar gameplay to the original Club Penguin, but was lacking many of the features. To cut a long story short, it flopped. People were outraged at this shell of such a beloved game that was even more of a cash grab than its predecessor, and it didn't even last two years before it was discontinued in December 2018. Finally, the Club Penguin brand was officially laid to rest, and all that remained were the private servers, which were unofficial replicas of Club Penguin made by fans. Some of these had been created years prior, but became particularly popular after the original Club Penguin game was discontinued. These servers were a ray of sunlight on a cloudy day for those whose lives had been destroyed by the death of Club Penguin, but they weren't without their problems. They had poor security, and the earlier ones had to actually be downloaded onto your computer. Eventually, Disney served DMCA notices to the most popular servers, forcing them to shut down, but to this day, a few remain. As I said earlier, when I checked out a couple of the remaining servers, it did somewhat fill the penguin-shaped hole in my heart, but they don't match up to the original game. One of them was literally a ghost town. I didn't encounter a single other player, and some of the rooms are unavailable. The best one I tried was CP Legacy. I think all the rooms are accessible, and the games seem to work fine, but it's hardly full of life. I'm fairly sure a lot of the penguins on there are bots, and one of the only areas they seem to congregate is the town. You can't adopt Puffles, and as far as I'm aware, there aren't any events or seasonal decorations. So once you've played for a few hours, there's not really a lot to do, and nothing to look forward to. The main problem with these servers is a lack of moderation, though. While some of them, such as Club Penguin Rewritten, seem to have at least a basic version of the original game's chat filters, others are pretty much unrestricted. 
Within minutes of logging on, I encountered one player who seemed to have become enraged at the bots and declared, I'm going to wrap you. Club Penguin Rewritten was perhaps the best remake of the original game. It was released in February 2017 and boomed in popularity during the pandemic. It eventually amassed over 11 million registered users before it was eventually shut down in April 2022, and three suspects thought to be involved with its development were arrested in London. Two of the developers of the original game, Lance and Lane, acknowledged the benefits of the remake and expressed their disagreement with Disney for shutting it down, while noting their concerns regarding child safety in private servers. Others argued that the shutdown was overkill, and I'd be inclined to agree, considering Disney had chosen to discontinue the original game and had no plans to do anything with the Club Penguin brand in the future. But Club Penguin rewritten hadn't exactly been smooth sailing from the off. In January 2018, it suffered a data breach in which 1.7 million users' data was compromised, including email addresses, IP addresses, usernames and passwords. It wouldn't be the end of the world if your account on this site got hacked. It's not like you had to pay for membership or anything, but a lot of people use the same passwords for everything, so it'd be a big problem for anyone who would use their normal email address and password. There was another larger data breach in 2020 as well. This time, over 4 million users were affected. It wasn't until after this second data breach that users were made aware of some of the drama occurring behind the scenes that was threatening the existence of the game. The team members who were running the site were doing so voluntarily. Although there had been a couple of attempts to generate some revenue just to cover the costs of running it, none of the volunteers were actually being paid, which meant that beyond the urge to not be dickheads, nothing was really stopping them from trying to sabotage the project. One of the team members, Cody, leaked his colleagues' personal information online and specifically to cybercriminals, including email addresses, home addresses, and photos of their faces, and he encouraged people to send pizzas and emergency services to their houses. He also sent an obviously fake letter to the team, claiming to be Disney and insisting that they shut down the site, as well as creating websites to slander his then-former colleagues. This incident led to the temporary shutdown of the game in March 2018, the following year, the admins allegedly got drunk while celebrating the new year with players, resulting in them making various inappropriate comments and playing music that wasn't family-friendly. Nearly three years later, another person was kicked off the team after allegedly making various racist comments and even starting a relationship with a player. All this goes to show that while the remake of the game may have been an idea of good faith, Having volunteers who won't really face any consequences for acting inappropriately is kind of a recipe for disaster, especially with a game designed for children. The mess that Club Penguin rewritten became was a drop in the ocean, though, compared to one of its competitors, Club Penguin Online. CPO was released in January 2018, right around the time of Club Penguin rewritten's first data breach. There were even a couple of conspiracy theories floating around at the time, suggesting that the team behind CPO was actually responsible for the CPR leak to encourage players to move over to CPO, and honestly, I wouldn't even be surprised. Fuel was added to this fire later when Discord messages from Antony, the creator of CPO, were leaked, showing him discussing his plans to take down other private servers responding to someone suggesting they take down CPR with, Why not build our empire by conquering the weaker CPPSs first? Cody, the former CPR staff member who had gone rogue, ended up joining the CPO team and continuing his unethical shenanigans, which makes me wonder if he was working for CPO all along, and his actions within CPR were a deliberate attempt to ruin that server so CPO could prevail. 
Furthermore, a CPO volunteer, who was a minor at the time, claimed that he was encouraged to find out and publish the personal details of those working on competing servers, including their addresses, photos of them, and even information about their families. CPO contained ads, but unlike CPR, which had used ad revenue to cover the costs of running the game, Anthony was accused of keeping the profits for himself, apparently around £9,000, which explains why he was so ruthless in his attempts to destroy his competitors. CPO was inferior to CPR in many ways. It was less secure in terms of privacy, it apparently wouldn't allow you to delete your account, and while CPR had done a pretty good job with moderation, CPO was seriously lacking. It even had an unregulated server for people over the age of 18, but there was no verification method to confirm that players entering this server were adults. Even on the supposedly child-safe servers, it wasn't uncommon to see penguins swearing, and more concerningly, making racist and homophobic slurs, and not safe for work messages. Players were literally publicly role-playing explicit acts via the chats, and there were either no moderators around to stop it, or the mods simply allowed it to happen. This is hardly surprising, considering Anthony was accused of making various racist, homophobic, and transphobic comments towards players and volunteers. The original game and CPR both prevented users from sharing personal information, such as phone numbers and email addresses, but CPO had no such filters, resulting in players sharing their social media accounts. Among these players would have inevitably been children who were now at risk of being contacted by predatory adults, and adults trying to lure children in to god knows what outside of the game. Little did players know that the main threat to their safety was the man who created CPO. The volunteer who was encouraged to dox rival servers wasn't the only underage individual working for Antony. He was allegedly inappropriately involved with various young girls, many of whom he'd recruited as moderators, and he was known to attempt to bribe underage girls who applied for moderator positions by promising them the position if they sent nude photos of themselves. If any of these girls betrayed him, he'd share their nudes in his Discord server, which is messed up on so many levels. He was manipulating underage girls into sending inappropriate photos that were illegal for him to be in possession of in the first place, violating them further by sharing these photos with others, and exposing other members to literal CP without warning. Anthony was described by some as a cult leader, and honestly, it's not hard to see why. He had a dedicated team who he convinced to do his dirty work, and even after he was openly being a nonce, some of his team members were scared of speaking out or leaving the server, in case he doxed them and their families, like he'd done to many of his enemies before. Eventually, in May 2020, Club Penguin Online was shut down after Disney issued copyright notices to it and all other private servers. Anthony was arrested on suspicion of possessing indecent images of children. It's honestly quite depressing knowing what became of a game that brought many of us so much joy as children. Although the original game had a dark side, Overall, it was still one of the safest spaces for children in the mid-2000s until its discontinuation in 2017. The same can't be said for some of the remakes, though. As sad as it was to see Club Penguin go, after everything that happened after, perhaps it would have been better to let it rest in peace. I'd be interested to hear your thoughts in the comments, plus any topics you'd like me to cover in a future video. If you enjoyed the video, please consider liking and subscribing. Huge thank you to my Kofi members and channel members, whose names are on screen now. I really appreciate your support. Remember to click the link in the description, or scan the QR code on screen now to download June's Journey for free. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time in a new video.